Beer is the cheapest room in the house. I'd like to see you living in better conditions. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Be the lifeboat, not the storm. In 2018, the Rockport Democratic Town Committee chose to march with lifeboats rather than giant blue waves. Because we are a seaside community, and in this town, giant waves have torment. But we have the facts on our side. Why can't we just win the argument by being right? Well, being right sure feels good. But aggressive reassertion of facts doesn't help people hear you or remember what you said. At the end of today, 4 million blogs will be posted, 80 million Instagram photos uploaded, and 600 million tweets released into cyberspace. That's more than 7,000 tweets per second. Why do you spend precious moments every day sharing information? There's probably many reasons, but it appears that the opportunity to impart your knowledge onto others is internally rewarding. A study conducted at Harvard showed that people were willing to forego payment in order to have their opinions broadcast to others. Now, we're not talking well-crafted insights here. These were people's opinions about whether Barack Obama enjoys winter sports or whether coffee is better than tea. A brain imaging study showed that when people had an opportunity to share these pearls of wisdom with others, their reward center in the brain was very strongly activated. You feel a burst of pleasure when you share your thoughts, and that drives you to communicate. It's a nifty feature of our brain because it ensures that ideas are not buried with the person who first had them. And as a society, we can benefit from the minds of many. But for that to happen, sharing is not enough. We need to cause a reaction in others. What then determines whether you affect the way people behave and think, or whether you're ignored? So as a scientist, I used to think that the answer was data. Good data, coupled with logical thinking, that's bound to change minds, right? So I went out to try and get, say, data. My colleagues and I conducted dozens of experiments to try and figure out what causes people to change their decisions, to update their beliefs, to rewrite their memories, we peeked into people's brains, we recorded bodily responses, and we observed behavior. So you can imagine my dismay when all of these experiments pointed to the fact that people are not in fact driven by facts. People do adore data, but facts and figures often fail to change beliefs and behavior. Wait, why would someone feel a reward when they sent the tweet? Wouldn't the emotional reward come only after winning the argument? So-called conservative economic plans don't reward the little guy. So how have so many little guys been trained to believe in them? Because they get an internal reward when they imagine winning the argument. It's all about the power of maybe. This monkey has been trained that when the little light comes on, it's one of those sessions where I can now get food, and it knows that if I press this lever 10 times, after a little bit of a delay, I'll get some food. If I press the lever 10 more times, I'll get some more food. It understands the task. So what do we have here? We have first a signal, the light coming on, saying it's one of those sessions. We're starting one of those. Then the monkey does the work, and then with a delay, it gets the reward. And what everyone initially thought was dopamine would go up after the reward. That's not when it goes up. It goes up when the signal comes on. What's this? This is the monkey there sitting and saying, I know this. I know the drill. I know this. I'm on top of this. This is going to be great. I know what I do now. This is completely perfect. 100% I'm going for today. Dopamine is not about pleasure. It's about the anticipation of pleasure. It's about the pursuit of happiness rather than happiness itself. And what's most remarkable is experimentally, if you block that rise of dopamine from occurring, you don't get the work. 
you don't get the behavior. This is not only the anticipation, but this is what is capable of eliciting goal-directed behavior. Amazing elaboration on this, which now begins to tell us something real familiar. Okay, so in this study, elaboration, rather than this design, you press the lever the right number of times, you get reward. Do the work, you get a reward 100% of the time, that's how it works. Now instead shift to where you get the reward only 50% of the time. You do the work and only about half the time you get the reward. So what happens to dopamine levels there this is what they do. They go through the roof. Because what have you just done? You've introduced the word maybe into the equation. And maybe is addictive like nothing else out there. Because the light comes on and you're doing the, I know how this works, this is gonna be great, but I screwed up last time because I didn't get the food, but this time I'm feeling good today, but I'm a total screw up though. And I'm inadequate in junior high school and it was terrible, and I kept, but maybe this time this is my lucky day. And just vacillating all over the place. What we see here is dopamine comes pouring out like mad. It's the uncertainty of the reward. And here's the really elegant thing they did in that study. Now, instead of a 50% reward rate, either a 25% or 75%. These are diametrically opposite states. Worse news, better news, the only thing they have in common is you've decreased the level of unpredictability and the rise in dopamine winds up being halfway between the 50% and the 100. And what's this about? This is the world of brilliant social engineering by humans, say, in Las Vegas, who understand how to design a place to take a curve where somebody has a gazillionth of 1% chance of getting a reward and making you think because it's this special day in this casino and you especially are so much tilted to the right that you are going to get and humans are profoundly manipulable in this realm. And it turns out so are other species, the exact same neurochemistry. I'm lost. Aren't people different from rats and monkeys? Yes but not in the way you might think. So what winds up being unique about us? And what you see is, with humans, it's the time dimension. You get the signal, you do the work, you get the reward. And the question becomes, how much time, lag time, can there be between the work and the reward to still elicit the behavior, to still get the work coming out? And we have just entered uniquely human terrain there for the very simple reason that probably most of us recognize, which is somewhere along the way, almost all of us worked very hard in school to get good SAT scores, to get into a good college, to get GREs, to get into a good grad school, to get a good job, to get in the nursing home of our choice there, sort of thing. And what we see is this astonishing ability of humans to keep those dopamine levels up for decades and decades waiting for the reward. And in the most bizarre, unique realm of this in humans, sometimes we could maintain it with a belief system where the reward doesn't come in our lifetime. The reward comes after our death. The reward comes in our afterlife. The reward comes unto the next generations. And there's no monkey out there who's willing to lever press all the time because of what St. Peter's going to think somewhere down the line. So that is unique about us. OK, so people will work hard for a dream. Isn't a fear of hell also operating? Why doesn't warning people that their future will be hell work just as well as promising people they will go to heaven? The problem with an approach to prioritize information is that it ignores what makes us human our desires, our fears, our emotions, our prior beliefs, our hope. Let me give you an example, climate change. My colleagues, Cass Seinstein, Sebastian Buzila Zoara, Stephanie Lazara, and I wanted to know whether we could change the way people think about climate change with science. So first of all, we asked all of our volunteers, did they believe in man-made climate change? Did they support the Paris Agreement? And based on their answers, we divided them into the strong believers and the weak believers. We then told everyone that experts estimated that by 2100, the temperature would rise by six degrees, and please give us your own estimate. So the weak believers gave an estimate that was lower than the strong believers. 
Then came the real test. We told half of all the participants that the experts have reassessed their data and now conclude that things are much, much better than previously thought and the temperature would only rise by one to five degrees. We told the other half of participants that the experts have reassessed their data and now concluded that things are much, much worse than previously thought and the temperature would rise by seven to 11 degrees. And please give us your own estimate. The question was, would people take this information to change their beliefs? Indeed, they did but mostly when the information fit their preconceived notions. So when the weak believers heard that the experts are saying that actually things are not as, as bad as previously thought, they were quick to change their estimate in that direction. But they didn't budge when they learned that the experts are saying that actually things are much worse than previously predicted. The strong believers showed the opposite pattern. So when they heard that the experts are saying that things are much more dire, they changed their estimate in that direction, but they didn't move that much when they learned that the experts are saying that things are not that bad. When you give people information, they are quick to adopt data that conforms their <coughs> pre-notions, but often will look at counter evidence with a critical eye. This will cause polarization, which will expand and expand as people get more and more information. What goes on inside our brain when we encounter disconforming opinions? Andreas Kappas, Reed Montague and I, invited volunteers into the lab in pairs. And we simultaneously scanned their brains in two MRI machines while they were making decisions about real estate and communicating those assessments to one another. What we found was that when the pair agreed about a real estate, each person's brain closely tracked the opinion of the other and everyone became more confident. When the pair disagreed, the other person was simply ignored and the brain failed to encode the nuances of that evaluation. Did she just say that if the information disagreed with what the person believed, it wasn't even encoded by the brain? Yep. So that's why my cousin doesn't remember that I won our last political argument? Yep. This is just about uninformed or uneducated listeners, right? Nope. In other words, opinions are taken to heart and closely encoded by the brain, mostly when it fits our own. Is that true for all brains? Well, if you see yourself as highly analytical, brace yourself. People who have better quantitative skills seem to be more likely to twist data at will. In one study, 1,000 volunteers were given two data sets, one looking at skin treatment, the other at gun control laws. They were asked to look at the data and conclude, is a skin treatment reducing skin rashes? Are the gun laws reducing crime? What they found was that people with better math skills did a better job at analyzing the skin treatment data than the people with worse math skills. No surprise here. However, here's the interesting part. The people with better math skills, they did worse at analyzing the gun control data. It seems that people were using their intelligence not necessarily to reach more accurate conclusions, but rather to find fault with data that we're unhappy with. So if good data isn't enough, what does shift beliefs? There are four factors that determine whether a piece of evidence will alter your belief. Your current belief, your confidence in that current belief, the new piece of evidence, and your confidence in that piece of evidence. And the further away the piece of evidence is from your current belief, the less likely it is to change it. This is not an irrational way to change beliefs, but it does mean that strongly held false beliefs are very hard to change. There is one exception though. When the counter evidence is exactly what you wanna hear. For example, when people are told that others see them as much more attractive than they see themselves, they are happy to change their self-perception. <laughs> Or if you learn that your genes suggest that you're much more resistant to disease than you thought, you're quick to change your beliefs. What about politics? Back in August, 900 American citizens were asked to predict the results of the presidential election by putting a little error on a scale that went from Clinton to Trump. So if you thought Clinton was highly likely to win, you put the error right next to Clinton. If you thought 
it's a 50-50, you put it in the middle, and so on and so forth. They were also asked, who do you want to win? So half of the volunteers wanted Trump to win, and half wanted Clinton to win. But back in August, the majority of both the Trump supporters and the Clinton supporters believed that Clinton was going to win. Then a new poll was introduced, predicting a Trump victory. And everyone was asked again, who do you think is going to win? Did the new poll change their predictions? Indeed, it did. But mostly, it changed the predictions of the Trump supporters. They were elated to hear that the new poll was suggesting a Trump victory and were quick to change their predictions. The Clinton supporters didn't change the predictions at much, and many of them ignored the new poll altogether. The question then is, how do we change beliefs? I mean, surely opinions do not remain stable. They do evolve. So what can we do to facilitate change? The secret is to go along with how our brain works, not against it. So the brain tries to assess a new piece of evidence in light of the knowledge it already stores. And when that piece of evidence doesn't fit, it's either ignored or substantially altered, unless, of course, it's exactly what you want to hear. And when that piece of evidence doesn't fit, it's either ignored or substantially altered, unless, of course, it's exactly what you want to hear. So perhaps, instead of trying to break an existing belief, we can attempt to implant a new belief altogether and highlight the positive aspects of the information that we're offering. This all sounds very abstract, I know. Let me give you an example, vaccines. So parents who refuse to vaccinate their kids because of the alleged link to autism often are not convinced by science suggesting that there's no link between the two. What to do then? A group of researchers, instead of trying to break that belief, offered the parents more information about the benefits of the vaccine, true information, how it actually prevents kids um, from encountering deadly disease. And it worked. So when trying to change opinions, we need to consider the other person's mind. What are their current beliefs? What are their motivations? When someone has a strong motive to believe something, even a hefty suck of evidence to the contrary will fall in deaf ears. So we need to present the evidence in a way that is most convincing to the other person, not necessarily in the way most convincing to us. Identify common motives and then use those to implant new beliefs. Thank you. OK, so what has this to do with lifeboats? Why can't we just use powerful military metaphors, you know, like shock and awe? Because shock and awe hath torment, and torment causes stress. And stress makes you less able to change. Let me just make this last point, which is um, a really important thing for all of this is to consider the mental state of the person in front of you. I mean, I already told you that things are different under depression, for example. Um, but they're also different under different mental states like stress. So what we find is that under stress, the brain function changes a lot. And the way that we process information changes really, really fast. And people become hypervigilant to negative information around them. So for example, in one study, we brought people into our lab. And we asked them to, and we told them, I'm going to give you a task. And then I'll give you a surprise topic. And you're going to give, you have to give a talk about the surprise topic in front of everyone. We're going to judge you. We're going to record you. We're going to put it in YouTube. So basically what I'm doing today, but I prepared. Um, and people got really stressed. We made sure they were stressed. We looked at their cortisol and their saliva. We looked at skin conductance. So when you stress, you start sweating. And your skin conductance goes up. We asked them, are you stressed? Yes, they were stressed. And then we did the same experiment that I showed you earlier, um, where we give you information that could be unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad. And we see whether you incorporate that information into your beliefs, right? Like, you know, oh, you're more likely to get cancer. You're less likely to be a victim of card fraud and so on. What we found was that under stress, immediately, people became more likely to incorporate negative information into their beliefs than they were just a few seconds ago. And then at that point, there wasn't a bias, what we call a desirability bias. It went away. They were, they were balanced in how they took in the good news and the bad news. We did the same experiment with firefighters in the state of Colorado. So the interesting thing about firefighters is that their day can be quite varied. So some days are relaxed. They're in, you know, they're in the station. They're just relaxing. And some other days are really their life-threatening events. right? 
And they did our studies um, in the station, and they had different days. Some are stressed, some are not. And what we found was on stressful days, when they were stressed out, they were more likely to take in the information that we gave them that was negative than on relaxed days. Although the information had nothing to do with their job, right? It's this general enhancement of taking in bad news that stress causes. It's not as specific. So you can see how, in response to stressful public events, like uh, market collapse or terrorist attacks um, or um, natural disaster, a lot of the stuff that we had recently, causes people to be stressed. Even if the event is halfway around the world, people often, their stress levels go up. And that what happens is that people start getting hypervigilant to negative information in the media, more likely to take it in. That makes them more pessimistic, sometimes overly pessimistic, and that could cause suboptimal decisions. How to get people to listen from Talia Sharat's influential mind. Getting people to listen means shifting that large metaphor calculator inside their minds, the one that computes the value of information and motivates them to pay attention when it shows positive numbers. If the knowledge you have can fill another's information gap, highlight the gap. If it can help people better their world, clarify how. Finally, reframe your message so that the information you provide will induce hope, not dread. Lifeboats present a positive future of muscular heroism and repair. They allow us to join with others to save the issues we all care about. Your community has a version of lifeboats, even if you live far from the water. Use whatever metaphor is already in the minds of the people you're trying to convince. But if you want to change minds, be the lifeboat, not the storm. Got it? No, I can't remember anything you said. Something about boats? Okay, yes, lifeboats. And influencing people. To review. One, people tend to hear and adopt information that supports what they already believe. Two, Unless the new information is better than they thought, then they'll adopt the new belief. Under stress, people tend to focus only on negative information. Thus, the magic of step two fails to operate. Therefore, if you want to influence people to change their positions, you'll do best to present positive outcomes in a non-threatening manner. Rescue is a positive human impulse. It transcends party and belief. We all need it sometime. Most of us will do it if we can.